Welcome to another episode of Podcast from the Past. I am Omar Brown. And I'm Christine Riggi. We're members of the Winnie Lark Preservation Committee. Today, we're speaking with Dr. Ann McKibben and Dr. Keith Mages, curator of the Robert L. Brown History of Medicine Collection in Abbott Library at the University at Buffalo. Dr. McKibben is a professor emeritus of health research methods, evidence, and impact at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And she's also the niece of our subject today, Elsie Blanche Augustine, a Canadian-born U.S. Army nurse during World War I. So happy to be here. Uh, I'm from the Robert L. Brown History of Medicine Collection uh, and the University of Buffalo South Campus. And we collect broadly on the history of the health sciences. So we have manuscript uh, collections, we have rare books and artifacts that are from, actually from the Roman period on up to about 1920 and 30. Um, today, we are here talking about one of our more recent acquisitions, which is the Elsie Blanche Augustine U.S. Army Nurse in the Great War Collection. Uh, and joining me is Dr. Ann McKibben, who is the grandniece, correct? Correct. Of the diarist's um, nurse who created this, this diary, Elsie uh, Blanche Augustine, who we'll refer to as Blanche in this, in this interview. Um, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure. It, uh, you know, when I started out on this project, it, I had no idea where it would take me, but it certainly gave me a new respect for, uh, for the family and, mm -hmm. and the war, yes. Absolutely. The, um, the collection itself is a series of photographs, letters, diaries, and other documents relating to the experiences of the Canadian-born nurse who served in France as a United States Army nurse during the Great War, which is World War I. And she served at Base Hospital Number 23. It was supported and established by the people of Buffalo. Born in 1895 in Waynefleet, Ontario, Canada, Elsie Blanche Augustine attended the nursing school attended nursing school in Buffalo, New York, at the Millard Fillmore School of Nursing, and graduated with a nursing degree in 1914. She was first stationed in Ellis Island Hospital in New York City, where she served for more, most of the war years, before going off to the base hospital 23 in Vittel, France, from 1917 to 1919. Uh, and then she was discharged and was able to leave in 1919 at the end of the war. Um, and we're going to talk more about her diary. Uh, about your process of transcribing the diary for yourself and for your family and then ultimately donating it to us so that others can benefit from what you found and from your aunt's life. Okay, sounds good to me. Uh, so let's talk about the diary. Um, so the diary itself uh, in our collection is about 57 pages. You found a handwritten, small, uh, three-hole punch. Uh, when you found it, it was in an envelope, correct? It mailed to your father, is that right? Mailed to my mother. Your mother, okay. Okay, just to step back step a little back. bit, yeah. historically, <laughs> um, uh, people in the armed forces were, it was really frowned upon okay. to keep a diary okay. in case, you know, the they were overrun. Right. They, did, they did not want diaries being found by the enemy. And your aunt was very close to the front lines, was she not? Um, they constantly heard the, the cannons, and uh, yes. Yeah. And, but she... I'm very glad that she kind of skirted the rules a little bit because what we've learned from her, her research has, or her, her diary is very, very valuable for research and I think also for your family's kind of history. Right, and that was one of the most exciting things I found. She, she skirted a lot of stuff, <laughs> and stuff that I had never, um, never imagined. She became a much richer person for it. Yeah. But anyway, back to how the diary came. Mm -hmm. She died in 1970. Okay. So quite a while ago, mm -hmm. um, and in 1979, my mother um, 
got the diary in the mail, and it came okay. from one of Aunt Blanche's best friends who'd okay. been in the war with her, okay. and that was in 1979. Okay. We did not even know it existed. So it came spontaneously. Spontaneously, yep. right out of the blue. Okay. Um, and Ann Austin, her best friend, okay. it was a nurse historian in uh, various places in the States. And then it sat for many years um, in my mother's filing cabinet okay. until after she died, we went through and found the okay. diary. Uh, at that time, I was getting ready to retire. Mm -hmm. So when you have a diary to transcribe and being retired, uh, I took it on. Mm -hmm. And the more I got into it, the more I was fascinated. You know, this was not a story just for me. Mm -hmm. It it. I wanted my daughters, I wanted my sister, I wanted my nieces to hear more about about this person who was becoming much more real to me. And then as we went along, I realized that this wasn't just my family's story. This was a story, this is Buffalo's story. Mm -hmm. This is nursing stories. Yeah. You know, Buffalo played a huge role in both world wars by sending hospitals to France. Mm -hmm. and. Yeah, it just is a story that needs to be told. Yeah, yeah. It, so, wh when you when you first encountered the document, what were some of your first thoughts? What struck you about it? Um, what made you realize how important it was? I think I just initially it was just a diary, and okay. I thought, oh, there might be something interesting mm -hmm. in here. And usually, diaries are pretty boring. They talk about the weather. They talk about you know what did they eat. You right, know what right. movies did they go and mm -hmm. see. Um, but the more I dug deeper into it, I realized that that I could take things and and do more exploring and find out the richness. Mm. You know, she talked about going to Child's Restaurant. Mm. Well, Child's Restaurant turned out to be the very first fast food restaurant <laughs> chain in the United States. <laughs> You know, she went to hear, um, she was in a parade, mm -hmm. and Sousa was there with his marching Sousa, wow. band. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of stuff. that The people that you read about, but your aunt was part of the experience. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. You know, and then she went to opening of films and, uh, you know, just really rich. And just to do a little bit of a correction, mm -hmm. she wasn't serving mm -hmm. in at the hospitals on oh, Ellis okay. Island. They were billeted there. Gotcha, waiting for it to be sent. Waiting okay. to be sent, and they wanted to be sent. They arrived the end of August, and they weren't sent off until November. Okay, and that was the time in her diary where she went to Child's and had more time to kind of... And they went shopping, a whole bunch of them, when they got paid their first paycheck, they took their money and bought blue silk blouses, which, okay. <laughs> you know, just just very real kind of situations. That's And we'll talk about that more, more but I know that sure. was one of the things that you mentioned that this diary is really powerful um, at illuminating it is kind of this juxtaposition between the demands of, of an army nurse, mm -hmm. um, but coupled with the kind of uncertainty of, as when those demands will be needed or w when you will have to act. So there were times when she would be working for, you know, days on end, folding bandages in the supply room, um, thinking about how Bored she was, and then later on she'll talk about um, you know the next day, an explosion happens and they're coming in by train and it's mass chaos. And I, I remember we spoke about that earlier about how that was something that illuminated um, kind of the experiences of nurses to you. I mean, it wasn't all just always on. It wasn't certainly getting your nails done. It was you know time to breathe, and then all of a sudden it's all all go. We need to move. Right. It's certainly in the Canadian situation, we say that in, when you're in the army, it's a hurry up and wait. Mm. <laughs> that kind of, I don't, probably you say the same sorts of I, I, things. Yeah, yes. yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense from what, what, what the diary says and what we've spoken about. Yeah. Right. And we see in the diary a, a lot that they, um, they would go shopping, they would, um, they would make fudge for the patients oh, well. that they had, okay. you know. Um, but nurses were in a funny situation. Mm. Nurses were considered officers. Mm -hmm. There, if you were an officer, then you could not hang out okay. with the enlisted men. So right. you couldn't hang out with the orderlies. Okay. You were to um, you were to fraternize mm -hmm. with with the, the physicians and the um, administrators okay. and the dentists. Mm -hmm. But quite often they were older men yep. who had left families. Yes. And back then, nursing wasn't the glamorous profession yep. it might be today. So the nurses had to rely on nurses yep. for a lot of their, a lot of their, 
day-to-day -day being. Yep. They went for walks. You know, they collected mushrooms and made, you know, they supplemented their food and you know, they made curtains for the, you know, the nurses were really important in nurses. Yep. And, and, and I think that's true today too. Yeah. Yeah. You have to rely on your, on your profession. Yes. Yeah. The, um, so all of this, I think, uh, kind of weaves so nicely into the big project that you undertook with this diary. So okay. you found the diary, you read through it, and you did copious research, but you didn't just rest on that. You actually created an annotated and transcribed version of the diary, um, which is an amazing treasure trove of information. Um, so not only can we read your aunt's words, but you've filled in the details as to, you know, she mentions Childs going there for, for, for a dinner. You have, you know, annotated that Childs was, you know, a cutting edge restaurant in New York City that everyone wanted to go to. Um, and you've smashed and planted with pictures, either pictures that your aunt took or photos from the National Library of Medicine or the Library of Congress um, to really help build up the world that your aunt lived in. Um, and so I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. Sure. Do you, so do you want to know the sources that I checked on? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So how did, you, how did you build this, the, the, the world so that we really fleshed out Aunt Blanche? world. Okay. First of all, um, because I'm a librarian, I, <laughs> I wanted some data. I yes, wanted good. some stats. So I went to the the U.S. Um, military collections. They di digitized a lot of stuff. So mm -hmm. I found out statistics, mm -hmm. you know, how many beds there were, wow. yeah. how many patients they saw. And actually the Buffalo Hospital saw proportionately more okay. patients than um, a lot of the other hospitals. The Army actually, just to step back a yeah. little bit, the Army... Um, well, I'll step back even further. Sure. The British and the French, okay. when the U.S. came into the war, the British and French said, we need money, we need soldiers, and we need doctors and nurses. Okay. The U.S. folks said, we'll give you money, we're sending soldiers, but you're not having our doctors and nurses. Okay. Okay. We're going to send you hospitals. Okay. So the Red Cross would get together with a city mm -hmm. and they would put together everything you need for a hospital, a 500 bed hospital. Mm -hmm. And then that would be transported over to the war mm -hmm. effort. And so the folks from that city would be the ones to muster up the support and, and go over, right? It was like That's the local right. re region. Okay, yeah. And it was $111,000 they raised. Oh, wow. And there's okay. a list of donors in the at the Buffalo Public Library. Um, so that got my statistical information mm -hmm. there. The U.S. National Library of Medicine and the Library of Congress have a, a really good collection of photographs. Mm -hmm. Because the hospital site, the Buffalo Hospital, was at a spa center, mm -hmm. an incredibly beautiful setting. So people from the Library of Congress and uh, what became the National Library of Medicine went to uh, Vitell, and there's many pictures there. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't a history of the Buffalo uh, Hospital, okay. but there's a history of the Detroit Hospital. Mm -hmm. In the little town of Vitell, the spa center, there were actually two hospital cities, two two cities hospital. Right. There was the Buffalo Hospital, mm -hmm. there was the Detroit Hospital. Okay, right. And so I, I got information on the, the ho Buffalo Hospital mm -hmm. from reading the history of oh, the Detroit the Hospital. Detroit one, right. Okay, where else did I go? I went to the Buffalo History Museum. Yes. They had very little information. Okay. I went to the New York City Hus mm -hmm. New York City Museum, thinking right. there'd okay. be information there, and they had histories of other okay. hospitals. I went to Ellis Island and talked oh, wow. to the yeah. head of research. Yes, yes. And he knew they had billeted nurses, mm -hmm. but he did not have. He had very little information. Oh, okay. I went a tour of the hospitals. The hospitals. In France? No. Oh, in, in Ellis Island. Ellis Island. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ellis Island had a, a series of hospitals. So if people would come mm -hmm. and they weren't well enough to be sent to to the mainland, mm -hmm. they were put in the hospital. This is where they would be. Okay. Gotcha. So I've got data from there too. The big thing was my husband and I in 1980, in 2018 okay. went to Vittel, did France. Go to Vittel. Nice. Yes. Yes. And we took the train across like Aunt wow. Blanche did. Yeah. And, oh. uh, I we, love it. Yeah, the hotel that we stayed in was actually the nurse's restaurant. And we found out that the the, the tourist folks and the history folks of a tell town museum knew very little about the the hospital in Buffalo. Oh, even the town museum. The town museum oh. wow. said yeah. no. Yeah. yeah. And you had said that this prior to the war, 
Vittel had been very well known as a spa community. A very rich spa community. Okay. It had started to be built up in the 1805. Rich people from Buff Buffalo and okay. um, all over, and princes and princesses wow. went there. And uh, <laughs> they built the buildings quite well. I mean, mm. beautiful, beautiful buildings. You can still go there. It's... Um, it's a, um, a Club Med site. Oh, very nice, yes. <laughs> yes. But of course, it was a summer resort. So okay. when they got there, there was no heating and very little water. For the, for the nurses, for the, for the hospital For the nurses, staff. for okay. the hospital staff. Yeah. So, so it was interesting. They so had the glamour to make had worn off a little bit? <laughs> a little bit, yes, yes. They loved the buildings in the summer. They weren't okay. too keen on the winter. I can imagine. And yeah, we had spoken earlier also about this topic. You had said that a lot of the buildings, because of how they were constructed, didn't have heat. Correct, um, yes. So the hospital itself was heated, but the mm. nurses' quarters, you were nope. on your own. They had five gallons of kerosene okay. for the winter. Wow, that doesn't sound like a lot to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where else? And that's about all. I'm, I, I guess the if someone wanted to pursue it a little further, yeah. the, all of the hospital documents are in a big warehouse in Kansas. Okay. I didn't make it to the New York Military Museum. And, um, yeah, that's about it. So, since you've, you know, um, with all with the background here, I would love to dive into thinking about the diary itself now. Um, sure. As you were building, you know, the annotated version, transcribing it, can you give us some highlights of some of your favorite passages? Okay. Keith asked me to pull out some highlights. <laughs> he said, give me two or three, and I think I've got seven. You <laughs> Which so, is great. More is better. That's fine. <laughs> okay. So remember, they, they took the train from Buffalo, um, this group of mm -hmm. nurses. They landed in New York City at the end of August. Okay. They were billeted in the hospital buildings. Mm -hmm. And um, October 1st is the first one I chose. Mm -hmm. And it said, we're still here on Ellis Island. When will we ever go? We went on the 2.30 boat to the city mm -hmm. because Ellis Island is very close to New York. Mm -hmm. We were paid today. We all feel like million, millionaires with $50. <laughs> Which actually is a decent amount of money back then. That's right. Yeah. A lot of Canadian nurses went into the U.S. Army because Canadian nurses were paid $10 a month and oh, wow. not $50 a month. That's a huge difference. Okay. <laughs> so can you imagine a bunch of young women you know, from rural wherever, mm -hmm. um, are being paid to live in New York City. Mm -hmm. But anyway, well, let's move on to November 21st. At last, I have something to write about. Received our orders and we're going to sail tomorrow. We leave the island at 8 o'clock. Such excitement. So it's been a long time. They actually spent, um, I think, U.S. Thanksgiving on the boat. Oh, wow. Yeah. Do you think, thinking about that quote, when she uses the term such excitement, is it anticipation for what's coming ahead or excitement as chaos? Which, which, which... I don't think they realized how brutal this was going okay, to be. Okay, okay. I think they were... More the, how we would think of the term excitement. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah okay. they, you know, this was a grand adventure. Okay, great. I'm sure there was a little bit of terror, but, but yeah, there was yeah. that... Yeah, because, you know, that word can be taken either way, and I know sometimes earlier... In the century, excitement could be, you know, the patient was excited. And okay. it wasn't they were happy. It was mm -hmm. they were, you know. No, these yeah, these yeah. women reading the diaries, they were thrilled to get yep, going. Got it. They mm -hmm. wanted to get going. So December the 8th, at 1 p.m., we were at the dock. Such crowds of soldiers of all nationalities. Mm. And she says, I'm homesick for the first time. Yeah. But what an adventure. Yeah, they, uh, they landed at South. Uh, they landed in the south of France. They took the train up to up to um, London. They mm -hmm. went on tours. They got to see Buckingham Palace, wow. and then they shipped up to the northern, and then they took the the boat across to France okay. at okay. Le Havre. Mm -hmm. Okay, so reality is setting in. Um, December nineteenth. Okay, mm -hmm. they're getting close to Christmas. They're on the train to Vittel. Yes, they didn't try to sleep. We sat up and froze all night. More hardtack and bully beef. Arrived at 3 p.m. Such a lovely village. Beautiful hotels and lovely villas. Instead of barracks, we're going to be going into these buildings. A pleasant surprise. 
Okay, so that was December. Mm -hmm. They spent Christmas. The folks at Detroit had come a week earlier, mm. so they uh, the two hospital staff spent Christmas together. Okay, they had a decent meal, which oh. she commented on. Yes, and I do remember they, that. Then they went sledding with some of the children mm -hmm. from the village. the The Buffalo Hospital and the Detroit Hospital were very good to the villagers. There, I remember you um, in the diary and the photographs, there's many pictures of the villagers, the children, and the nurses with them, too. So they had an ongoing relationship throughout the time that she was there, it seems like. Yes. Yeah. The, the, some of the women in the community would uh, do the laundry for mm -hmm. the nurses. Mm -hmm. I mean, they needed the money. Some of okay. the nurses would, right. would pay the embroiderers yeah. for for fancy work and whatnot. Uh, there was one surgeon, I think, who didn't um, didn't like to be bored. Okay. So I think he took out every tonsil that was in of the course, village. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we still don't have patience. Oh, yes, right. February the 12th, a warm spring day, up at 4.10. Yeah, the patients oh. are coming. Breakfast at 4.30. On duty at 5, but no patients until 8.30. 23 were admitted. Feel as though I've had a new lease on life. To think that I'm being able to do something for the soldiers. Nine stretcher cases, cases all nationalities, Belgium, French, Madagascan, Chinese, Arabian. Uh, February the 27th, quite a bit later, three letters. Letters were incredible. Letters and packages were incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Um, three letters, one from Daddy. Bless his heart. How I wish the folks at home could see us. They would envy us instead of pity us. That's you an know, interesting that's, line. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that's one of my favorite lines in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So, it does, I mean, I love that because so as the diary does go on, you can see that she's getting a little tired of the, of the rigmarole. Yes. But at this point, she still has a sense of duty. She's still very connected to the cause. And yes. I think that the winter hasn't broken her yet. <laughs> that's right. I mean, they have 23 patients yeah. and there's 62 nurses. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's the way to live. Mm -hmm. Okay. April 1st, we're moving along. No mail today. She was off duty from 10 to 4. So that's six hours off. That means that they were working 18-hour oh, days. Wow. Yeah. Consistently, yeah. seven days oh. a week. Seven days a week. Yeah. Wow. The, yeah. They were... Buffalo was told to send enough supplies for 500 beds. Mm -hmm. At one, a couple of points, they had 1,800 18, beds. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, yeah. Okay, so moving on, September 14th, we're getting close to the end of the war. Mm -hmm. And this is when things are getting a lot more hectic. A lot more hectic. And she said, we're very busy. She said, we're operating day and night. So many amputations. Surgeries look like slaughterhouses. Yeah. So I think, yes. Yeah, That's of the surgical th units, just limbs. Yeah. Yep. yep. And away they went. Wow. Yep. Wow. And then, of course, the war ended on the 11th of November, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until February the 6th mm. that they packed oh, up okay. and um, went home. Yep. And all of those records actually are in, in a warehouse in Kansas City. Okay. So, there okay. you go. That Somebody was the one that you had mentioned earlier that you'd hoped to get to, but you haven't been able to get there yet. To, to, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, the last few entries, she's you can tell she's really homesick. Yeah, she was saying, you know, it's Wednesday. We went 412 miles. Mm -hmm. You know, Thursday we went. Yeah, going back. But it's it seemingly how she works in the or writes in the diary at a snail's pace to her. Yes. I remember that. Yeah, yes. it's foggy today. We tried some games, but I, I can't get my mind off of 300 Two, miles away. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And then the last entry in the diary is April the 17th. We docked at 6 p.m. and yeah. the diary ends. That I, I was so happy that you chose that. Um, to, the, the ending quotes or the ending, the ending entries to, to, to talk about, um, to highlight, because I had, as I read through the diary too, when I got to that point, we had known her for so long. We had been through so much with your aunt, and it almost felt like losing contact with a friend when you get to that point of it. Mm -hmm. How did you feel, um, you know, being connected to her and 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 part of the family? It was fascinating. Yeah. I think you know because I knew the history. Mm -hmm. You know, she lived. Um, her house was at the end of our garden, so okay. she was she was quite a part of my life. Okay, yeah. I learned how to do hospital corners on bed sheets oh, yeah. before I was six years old. I mean, that's she the was just importance. a force yes. to be reckoned yep. with. This woman, mm -hmm. and you know, to me, she was kind of a cranky, okay. cranky 
65 year old mm -hmm. or 70 year old, mm -hmm. but, but completely different. Yes. So did you feel more connected to her after examining her diary and doing all the, the transcribing and annotation? Certainly more connected, more respect, and yeah. just a, a richer, richer yeah. understanding and, and a real appreciation. You know, she talked, my family were very big into the temperance movement, mm -hmm. but she talked about having all the champagne they oh, wanted because they were in wine country. You mentioned she was a little bit sometimes... Um, would push the boundaries, and so yes, that's another example yes. of that. Yes, and I hadn't seen that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and I think just just to add here, the it was tough to re-enter. You mm. know, we talk about it being tough for soldiers to re-enter, okay. but it was also tough for the nurses to mm -hmm. re-enter. Um, there was money available for the nurses to uh, study public health. Mm -hmm. A lot of the nurses did public okay, health. Right. Aunt Blanche did some pediatrics mm -hmm. with her friend Ann Austin in um, in Ohio. Okay. And I think pedi pediatrics was probably a good a good escape from. Oh sure, sure. War injuries. War, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And I think they had a really rich experience. Um, I, less than half of the cases they saw were war injuries. Okay. There were things like diphtheria and uh, cholera and mumps and measles yep. and chicken With pox. With the pediatric and, kind, right. yeah. And then there was the shell shock, the okay. PTSD stuff. At least 20% at least of British soldiers had okay. shell shock, and I'm sure it was the same for other nationalities yeah. too. Yeah, I, I, would, I would imagine. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing I feel like, and I'm not an expert on this at all, but when you're on the front lines, right, it's just adrenaline getting through, doing what you need to do to survive. And then it's only later on when you return that you Ooh, have that moment to, to, yes. to decompress and it all comes out. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so your aunt and some of her colleagues experienced that also, it seems like. Yes, yeah. yes. She married when she was 40 mm -hmm. and um, no children. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um but she stopped nursing. She went yeah. into real estate and gardening. Oh, interesting. Yes, yeah. gardening. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. My family farm is on Lake Erie and okay. some of the nicest beaches around. So yes. she was selling lakefront lots. Oh, wow. So, Very nice. There we go. Okay. So uh, was there any any surprises that you uh, uncovered um, besides the champagne drinking <laughs> that, that you know, the, the diary unveiled to you? I don't think any surprises. Okay. Other just kind of a rich appreciation yep. for the kinds of things. And as I thought more about sort of her legacy, mm -hmm. you know, as it, before the diary, she was, you know, kind of a little bit of memory yep. and, you know, a gravestone in the cemetery, sure. that kind of thing. But, but just her life just became that much richer, you know, and, and not having children. Yep. You know, children quite often are assumed to be your legacy, but mm -hmm. she did not have children. Mm -hmm. But but to me, this was giving her back her legacy. Right, right. Absolutely. And so that's an awesome bridge to where I wanted to ask you next. Okay. Um, how did this help you connect her to the rest of your family? And how was everybody, did you you know, have a grand unveiling party? Did you show it? How, how did it? Yeah, I'd like to know more about that. Okay, Santa brought a copy okay. of the diary to to all the nieces and nephews yes, yes, and, yes. and descendants, yes. I, I can see that being a really interesting gift. Right. Um, but I'm not convinced they've all read it. Yeah. But that's, a, you know, that's they another will. story. Yeah. Yes. I, I really think they, they will. That's the thing that as you do get older, I think you tend to look back more at where you came from. And... You have now laid this out beautifully while Aunt Blanche started it. Now you have wonderfully annotated and transcribed it and made it into a lasting version so that they can have this and learn from it. And you've also donated it to the University of nice, Buffalo. Nice segue. <laughs> <laughs> to, to us in the History of Medicine collection. And um, so we can preserve it and make it available for folks to learn from too. Um, how was that process? Was that difficult to make that leap? It was not okay. difficult okay. at all. Yeah. To me, it was such an important story for me, mm -hmm. such an important story for my family. But the more I looked at it, it's an incredibly important story yeah. for Buffalo. Yeah. The University of Buffalo, who who worked quite hard to send the hospital, mm. the, the city itself. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is where those documents belong. Yeah to this, yeah, they belong to the city. And, you know, your history of medicine collection is the place to go. Well, uh, 
We're thrilled to have it. And as a, as a public institution, we are. We're here for the public. And so it's to make it available to us so that we can make it available to the larger audience to learn mm -hmm. from this important story. Um, because it's not only about your aunt and the nurses. It's, it's about Buffalo, like you, you yes, said. It's the, a, the history yes. of the community who contributed towards this very successful endeavor. And it was successful. Buffalo had a higher proportion of patients than a lot of the other places did. They were very good to the villagers. Mm -hmm. They were, they treated a lot of prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just, you know, Buffalo has much to be proud of. Yeah. And we don't know about it. And well, th this helps us to shed a little more light on it because of the work you've done too. So thank mm -hmm. you for that, for both donating it and for again, doing the transcription of it and annotating because you've made a very valuable document even more accessible. Um, so. Right. And I think I'm just about finished with the document, mm -hmm. but I think it's time for someone else to take it on. Yep. To me, this is would be a PhD project. This would be a book project. Yep. This would be a summer student project. Yes. You know, um, I think there are more diaries out there. Yeah. There are more stories. I think with some advertising, you would get more material. Yep. I did a talk at the t Buffalo 20th Century Club. Oh, right, yes. And the fellow who was the parking lot attendant, his grandfather had been one of the orderlies in the hospital. Oh, there are, there are, there's, to me, there's just so much information mm -hmm. out there that can be dug up. Yeah, to learn more about the Buffalo Base Hospital 23 and the contributions of the community towards this yes. important effort. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, and um, I, w I mentioned to you earlier also that just recently I've had a researcher, a well-known nurse historian, has asked to use some of the photographs that your aunt um, took during her time. Um, and, and she's looking into the diary too to see what might fit with her research. So people are investigating this and are asking us to utilize it in their research. So this is why... Thank you for joining us in this podcast today because okay. it's, it's part of the promotion of this amazing resource. You're welcome, and thank you for helping me share this story. Of course. Thrilled. Make your mother proud of you and the old red, white, and blue. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there that the Sammies are coming, the Sammies are coming, the strong, strong coming everywhere. So prepare, say a prayer, send the word, send the word to beware. We'll be over, we're coming over, and we won't come back till it's over, over there, over there, over there.